Thank you, Professor. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, good of you, all of you guys to show up on, on an odd night. <laughs> yeah, well, spiritual things happen at odd times. <laughs> so that, that's pretty okay. And I guess what I want to do is, um, I kind of just want to run through something, and then at the end of it, we can take Q&As, which don't have to be part of this. Okay. Q&As can be part of any of the conversations we've had the entire weekend and so on. But basically, um, this for me is one of what, if I was to be asked, to kind of give a timeline on what I think is happening prophetically and where we are. When I say we, I'm talking about believers across the earth and what's about to unfold. And I think it's critical to share this here because I think the next thing post where I'll stop is very likely going to start emerging here. So I'm giving you a history of the church after Dubai. The question is, after this then? Those are the things we need to engage. So I'll put it in that way so that anybody else who gets to listen to this over time may be able then to piece things together. At the same time, I want to resolve the conflict of where does the church sit in all of this currently? Why do we sometimes sound like we are bashing the church? What's wrong with us? Maybe we're just crazy guys. Maybe there's just something wrong with us, you know. But the thing is, why would that be important? And then, what's the placement of economy, kingdom and economy? What's the placement? How does it come in? And in what way? Has it happened before? Can we track it in history? So this is kind of a history lesson, a futurist, <laughs> um, a kingdom lesson, all tied into one item. But if you can grasp as a foundational concept, it becomes like ground zero for where we want to go next. All right? So on the most basic level, uh, Amos 3.7 says, Surely the Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. That's the Berean version. The NKJV says, Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Now, the other verse I want to look at, but I want to stay with this for a minute. Now, this is interesting. It talks about the Lord wants to do something. But it says he won't do it until he reveals his plan to prophets. Meaning, we're not going to find out what God wants to do. God limited himself. But if he wants to do something, he must first reveal it to the prophets. Why? Because then the prophets have to speak it. Only then can it begin to unfold. Okay? And I'm talking here on the scale of the movement of nations, not on the scales of personal prophecy. All right? Now, I shared this the other night, so I won't stay too much on it. The sons of Issachar, who understood the times, and that's totally going to be critical. Where we are going next, understanding the times is going to be more important than theology, more important than knowledge, more important because you could fully understand about God and have no clue what he's doing. And that's a problem. Because then you'll be off on an agenda that he never asked for. Because um, the, the problem is that so many times we think that we've already worked out to go what God wants. And this is why there, there's a scripture Jesus gave. He says in, Ma, in Matthew 4, 4, he says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every proceeding word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, meaning God part time speaks. Now here's the problem. God doesn't speak in formulas. God speaks in steps. And God usually will not speak the next step until there's been compliance. Wow. <laughs> That's a problem. And compliance can take years. And God just won't speak. And I, I can, you see, Abraham, this is interesting. God says to he's still Abraham, says, get out of your father's house, out of your country, out of your nation to a land I will show you. He doesn't tell him where he's going. Mm. He just tells him to get out. And Abraham has to trust that. And as Abraham gets out, God, in fact, if you follow, he was told to get out. Part of the problem is that he took Lot with him. God told him to leave his relatives. Lot was a relative. But he felt responsible for Lot. You know, his nephew, his brother's son. 
You know the word lot means compromise, means delay, means adjusting the plan. So he took him with him. And it's interesting that God doesn't speak to Abraham again until Lot leaves. That's a profound concept right there. Go check in the Bible. God doesn't talk again. The day they separate ways, God speaks. That's funny. Meaning the instruction wasn't for Lot. <clears throat> it's for Abraham. So then God begins to define how far the land is. He gives him now details. He says from this, from that to the other. Then he puts a caveat. He says as far as your eyes can see. In other words, I don't set the limits for what I've given you, you do. So even though I've given you this vast territory, you'll only access as far as your eyes can see. That's a limitation for us. So with that background, we then understand that when we understand the times, it means this critical part, knowing what to do, meaning knowing what the next step should look like. Knowing what we should be engaging next is critical to moving to where God is going. Right? Oh, let's switch that off instead of. So, here's a, a model. The Bible says that God gives Moses a pattern. It says, I want Bezalim to build after the pattern that I showed you. So, even though God wants a tabernacle built, before He shows it to Moses, God wants to do a thing until he reveals. Then Bezalel can do it. So once we get insight, God expects compliance. That's the basic idea. Same thing you see, Joseph, Daniel, all of them, God shows that it can be done. God shows that it can be done. So that's the concept I'm establishing there. Now, <clears throat> and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, old men shall dream dreams. Now, the sons of Issachar means that every generation there's a sons of Issachar people. In the last days, there's a sons of Issachar people that God will pour out flesh, they will dream dreams, they will prophesy, they will see visions. Meaning, if you work back what I've said, it means that this is meant for something to be done. Surely the Lord will not do a thing until he reveals it. We have taken this to mean speaking in tongues, prophesying, speaking, saying things, not activating something God has shown. Historically, every time God showed a dream, it was something that needed to be built. Every time something was prophesied, it was something that needed to be done. So we keep prophesying, which means we keep pushing things into the future. <clears throat> we rarely engage it in the now. Yet the prophetic word is meant to be fulfilled, not to be prophesied. So prophecy is only so that it can be fulfilled. Alright? Okay. The word Issachar, I'll say very quickly to just give a picture, means reward, compensation, benefit, profit. So, it is said that actually the, in, in the class that they operated in as a, as a community, they were known, if you go and check scripture, you don't have time to dig into it, they were the wealthiest of all the tribes. Very interesting. Yet, the, the core issue was understanding the times and knowing what to do. I mean, naturally it means if you're one step ahead all the time, then you know exactly how to operate, right? I mean, Daniel got a dream, interpreted, knew what future kings would look like, what did Daniel do? Daniel became the advisor to all the kings because he knew exactly how to navigate every single one of them. That's the power of prophecy. All right? So, let's have a prophetic history class so we can understand the times we're living in so that we know, we don't guess what we, are, what we ought to be doing because that's usually the most critical thing. Now, God's ultimate intent, the kingdom come, there will be done on earth. So a brief review of church history reveals the ongoing, continuous activity of God in the earth. Notice, the ongoing, continuous activity of God in the earth. The history of the church is the story of a process of change. This process is marked by what is referred to as moves of God. Okay? 
These moves of God affect every aspect of life, from national to individual in every way. I wish the church understood that one phrase. That there is no point of having a move of God if it doesn't have effect nationally. <coughs> Otherwise, it's not a move of God, it's a move of the church. Mm. Mm. Wow. We need to totally separate a move of the church and a move of God. When God moves, the earth shifts. Surely the Lord will do a thing. Once more, I will shake the heavens and the earth. So when God moves, the earth moves. When the church moves, not necessarily the earth moves. But let's now connect how God has parallel movements of the church with movements on the earth. And how we usually miss it. And that's what's going on now. Something is happening in the spirit and the church could totally be missing it again. And that's a problem. Okay? So unfortunately, the church causes the change, then steps out of the way. Always. We activate stuff. I've heard the voice of my people. God responds. When God is responding, we exit, we go back to church and we leave the world to take advantage of what we activated. And we call it industrialization. And I'll show it to you. So let's start with Martin Luther. The Protestant movement, as we call it, in 1500, this move of God came into existence because a prophet of God, again, he may have been a Catholic, but he was a prophet. He put down the 95 Theses, which today we all agree was totally accurate. Okay? He received a revelation of justification by faith. Those two scriptures popped out of him, and he, he was a priest. He turned against the Catholic Church, nailed the Theses on the Wittenberg, cathedral, and that began the greatest reformation we've known in this generation. All right? Now, the invention of the printing press happens exactly when Martin Luther does this. Now, here's the interesting story. Martin Luther has a reformation. Here's God. He says that just shall live by faith. No longer should we keep the word away from people. Many people need to be able to read the Bible for themselves. We can't keep priests to be the only people, and so on and so forth. And voila, the printing press is printed, is invented. Interesting. So one person says everybody should read. The technology for it shows up. Wow. <laughs> now, what people don't know about Joseph Wittenberg, who invented the printing press, is that he was a jeweler. And he was persecuted in Germany, went to Sweden for a while. In Sweden, the Chinese had just shown up with their idea of typefaces. But they were having a problem with developing ink. His knowledge, I'm giving you now backstories, these are the kind of stuff I research. <laughs> so his knowledge of, of jewelry and all that kind of chemical stuff, he invented ink and moving type. And so he invented the Gutenberg printer. Now, did you know the Gutenberg, that the Bible was the first mass product printer in the yeah. Gutenberg printing press? Yeah. The first book ever to be printed. And the Bible is still the greatest selling book of all time, till today. Interesting. Now, what did we do as usual? We walked away from the printing press, and the next thing that began being printed was junk because we left the technology that God gave us and we moved away from it. Now we have the Bible, we were happy. What happens in the environment called Germany? Germany becomes a superpower. Interesting. Move of God, superpower. Every time when the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. Next thing, Hitler and the Nazis arise. Why? Because the church moved out of governance. The church went and retained the cathedral concept of hiding from the public. John Wesley, the Holiness Evangelical Movement of 1800, the most significant man used by that time was John Wesley, the most outspoken exponent of holiness. So three main truths were restored in this movement, sanctification, 
baptism by immersion and divine healing. Notice, Martin Luther restores the just shall live by faith. It's like the next progress of knowledge is sanctification, baptism, immersion, divine healing. First industrial revolution is activated. Parallel. Suddenly, from that time to the 19th century, we see mechanization coming. Then, agriculture, mass production, mass extraction of coal, the steam engine is invented. Britain becomes a superpower. Watch the processes. Now Britain is a superpower. Then we have a problem. Same problem we had with Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany thought they were gods. <laughs> now Britain, Commonwealth, they had a statement. They said the, the, the kingdom, the sun never sets on. Arrogance. We are greater than God. Mm. <laughs> That's why they built the Titanic. And they say the ship, even God cannot sink. Yeah. Human arrogance rises again. Same place where a move of God happens. And you see the parallel. Immediately, economy shifts. Everything changes. And then we have a problem. William Seymour, the Azusa Street Revival, Pentecostal movement, 1900. The Pentecostal movement brought the truth of speaking in tongues back to the body of Christ. This was paralleled by the invention of electricity, gas, and oil. Can you see the parallels? The power of the Spirit, power. Look at the parallels in history. It means God always activates things in the earth. Why did they invent electricity before? Why didn't they find gas or oil before? There you go. So we end up with the second industrial revolution, which opens up a whole world, synthetic fabric, dyes, fertilizer. We invent the telegraph, then the telephone, then transportation, then automobile, then the plane. Look at the connection. And where are all these things invented? In America. Where did the street happen? Do you see the connection? Suddenly, everything begins to change. Economic, industrial models, now we have large factories. Suddenly, that's where you got Ford and all the major companies, mega companies, because when it goes to us, how? That's where we came from. So America emerges as the next superpower. And what was the cry of America when it started? One nation under God. That was the model. That was the picture. That was the structure. Until 1947. Strange thing happens in a, in a court, case called Everson versus Board of Education, 1947. The court drew on Thomas Jefferson's correspondence to call for a wall of separation between church and state. And the next legislation passed by Senator Kennedy Sr. Prayer was thrown out of schools. Said, do not impose your religion on anybody. Yet, what bill it was? One nation under God. And that's when the decline of America started. Lateran movement, 1948. We, have, we are still in the second industrial uh, era. So now, a new thing opens. Lateran was like post, post Pentecostal. Now the prophetic is beginning to emerge. Right? Suddenly, that's when we began lifting of hands, worshipping, singing. That's when all this concepts of worship that we now are so used to began and came, the classic Pentecostals. That's when we started. And the Lateran movement was had a lot of people. There were Oral Roberts, Jack Coe, William Branham. And that's what spilled over into what we now call the charismatic movement. Now, you will discover something odd. Every move I have discussed, there's a segment of church that remained there, never moved. All those guys still exist. Think about it. The Methodists are still here. 
Yellow Tarans are still here. They just didn't move on. They stayed. Pentecostals, but most Pentecostals have no idea there was a charismatic move that came and ended. They are still Pentecostals. Charismatic moves, that's where, is where the Kenneth Copelands came in, John Austin, Benson Edahosa, Kenneth Hagen. That's a move many people still think is the Pentecostal movement. It's the charismatic movement, the mega church generation. And instead of having 10,000 members, 5,000 members, that parallels 1969, because that's when it was really birthed strongly. That's when all these men really begin to minister and speak. And as they did, something came into the earth, nuclear energy. Because these were the guys of power, the guys of incredible healings, major, major, major breakthroughs in the earth. This, this, this era is still, everybody still talks about, whenever we say revival, what we mean is we are hoping we can go back here. <laughs> And this birth the third, suddenly nuclear energy, rise of electronics, the microprocessors, biotechnology, PLCs, and robots. Same season, the charismatic. And that's where America's superpower position begins to peak. And then, 1900 to present day, more or less, Though 2020 something happened, as you notice, I gave you a specific date. What happened in 2020? COVID. Thank you. COVID. <laughs> you'll see how this unfolds. <laughs> oh. So the apostolic prophetic movement, so mostly of these people are still around. One of them is here talking. We are still here. But we have to be very careful that we don't end up here, like everybody else. This brought kingdom advance, prophetic accuracy, removal of dichotomy between the spiritual and the secular, etc. We begin to see a much more profound shift, which gave birth to the fourth industrial revolution, which is where we are, the disruptive era. Technologies, AI, VR, artificial intelligence. Why? Because there's great wisdom in the church now. Insight. Seeing things that nobody like this is the environment which that's why I am called a futurist. The idea is I'm supposed to help us get unstuck from here. Otherwise, we'll be exactly like everybody else. Now, having said that, let me touch on this moment. At the time I first presented this slide, it was in 2020, actually, 2019. And they say we're going, no, 2020 early. Just before COVID hit is when I first presented this. And I said we were about to enter a new crisis, and here's a problem. At that time, the debate in America was going on about Trump is of God, Trump is not of God. Prophets were having all sorts of issues. Some are prophesying Trump will win, some are prophesying he will, all sorts of things. I said this is the thing. There's one statement that Trump has made that is the final nail in the coffin. He said, let's make America great. But his statement to make America great again was not go back to God. It was get rid of the immigrants. That's what it meant. It meant let's make America white again. Let's get rid of all these guys who have shown up here. And that's why he got such support from the white supremacy groups and all those crazy people. And in the same moment, Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. That was the reaction. And that was the beginning of the end, because suddenly, we didn't need God anymore. We are great. America became the new God. From that moment, it's on a slippery slope, accelerating every day. What does that tell you? That it's time for something new, that God is birthing. And that thing, guys, is going to be birthed in Dubai. That's really what's going on, as you will see. Then I'm going to kind of describe the church in Dubai. That part you'll have to forgive me. Because the church in Dubai is a residue of all these churches. Gathered here. It's like the refugees of all those systems. 
coming together. And God wants to break that mold and activate the new thing because God is no longer going to work with a nation again. He's going to work with nations. And Dubai is a melting pot of nations. Come on, man. Come on. Wow. That's why it's crucial. Wow. <clears throat> so why has the church not prospered to date? Well, why have we not yet accessed the power to create wealth? And then let me just say this. There are three predominant sons, spiritual sons of Abraham. The Jew, the Muslim, and the Christian. Who is the poor brother? He's a Christian, obviously. <laughs> Yet, the Christian is the one who predominantly was meant to be the primary son. So something's wrong with our mother. So what has caused us not to prosper? What has put us in that fix? The first thing that has put us there is the escape mentality. We think salvation is the end. We think once we are saved, we are out of here. That's the problem. And look at this scripture in New King James. Mm -hmm. Repent therefore and be converted. That's Peter speaking. All right? To the Sanhedrin when they called him and demanded for him to explain himself. All right? Said you must repent therefore and be converted. That your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom the heaven must receive. The word receive here is very interesting. It's also withhold. It's also the Greek word resist. resist. It's, it's a picture of somebody trying to come, but you're holding them back. So the heavens are holding him back, not the devil. <clears throat> Why? Until the times of restoration of all things. What is the key word? Restoration, not destruction. <laughs> Important. Restoration. The church is expecting destruction. God is expecting restoration. Of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. Now you have to imagine, that means this is the phrase that every true prophet should understand and if they don't, they are a false prophet. This is a principle. Heaven will not let Jesus come back until the restoration of all things, not the destruction, of all things, which God spoke, remember when we started, God would do a thing until he tells his servants the prophets. Of all things, by the mouth of all his holy prophets is the world began. So what do we look for? We look for the prophetic things that were spoken concerning restoration. Mm -hmm. And realize that those things, until they come to pass, the end will not come. Now that's huge. Now that tells you, if Isaiah says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be chief among the mountains, and the nations will flow to it, and they will say, teach us your ways, then you just realized, until the nations come and tell us, teach us your ways, we have a problem. That means we have a journey first to have ways. <laughs> and then after we have the ways, the ways have to be proven. And after they are proven, then they will come and say teachers, which means it will be because of their observation, not because of our telling. Okay? Now this thinking pattern could probably be the single most devastating limitation the church has been subjected to, which in fact completely delays and even hinders the very thing it claims to propagate. So this thinking, we are saying Jesus must come, but we are doing everything that will make it impossible for him to come. Totally opposite. Yet we are claiming he must come. Why has the church not prospered? The current state of the work of Christ must be dealt with before we can be called kingdom entrepreneurs. So the escape man mentality manifests in three dimensions. Now here's the state of the church. 
but they're not just in Dubai, in most countries in the world, okay? This is what hinders us from understanding what God is doing. First, monastic behavior. We lock ourselves away from the reality of what is happening in the earth. And we basically say, we think the earth doesn't belong to the Lord, yet creation is waiting for our manifestation. So we have an exclusion mentality. We have an avoidance mentality. We train people in churches to avoid the world. Yet, that's the problem. So we, we are no longer in the monasteries, but we behave like monks. Because of this seclusion, don't engage, don't be involved, don't touch, stay away. Then we have insulated thinking. Now, how does that work? When you know you're living, and Dubai is a perfect example. How many migrants in Dubai invest here? How many? None. Why? Because you're leaving. As long as you have an exit mentality, you cannot engage or invest. Come on. Wow. Come on. Wow. Absolutely impossible. Yeah. You can't. So, you always have your bags virtually packed at any given time. Because at short notice, believe it. Yes. So the church has been in that mode for 200 years. We have bags packed. Those bags are no antiques that are packed. Because any time we are here. So that makes it impossible for us to restore anything. And do you know when you're about to travel, you pack light? Naturally. That's why church doesn't invest. The Jews believe in God and a Messiah, but they own the earth. They have no problem with it. Because they understand the earth is the Lord's. Wow. <laughs> the Muslims understand the earth is the Lord's. The Christians believe the earth is the devil's. Wrong doctrine. So we don't engage. We avoid. And as long as we don't engage, we miss every single opportunity God brings our way. When you're about to travel, the stuff that is await, you don't want to touch it because it's going to waste your time. If, if you knew you'll be here for six months, it affects the house you rent, it affects everything you do. If you know you're going to be here for five years, planning is different. You might yeah. buy a car. Yeah. If you think you're going to be here for 25 years, you'll buy a house. Mm. That's the difference. So the church has no real estate because it's in exit mode. So we are living in a permanent refugee camp. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Because we don't belong. Yet, the highest heavens belong to God. The earth he has given to men. This is our real estate. The guy who is illegal here is the devil, by the way. We don't know that. Because our preaching is our home. We believe Jim Reeves more than we believe God. This world is not my home. So what does it end up with? Irrelevance. Yeah. Irrelevant. Let me ask you, if you run a company, you run an organization, I mean, Lance, you guys are running a school. If you know that you have a teacher who is planning to live in a year, how much do you invest in them? Hardly. Because you know they're not going to be here. So suddenly, we've become irrelevant. We are so irrelevant that if we were raptured, we wouldn't be missed. It's the truth. 
Because if your absence is not felt, your presence was not required in the first place. I mean, think about it. There are people who show up in your life, and when they disappear within a week, forgotten them. But there are guys who you'll always remember. Why? Because they had value. So I always say, look, if we are going to leave, then we are going to leave a mark. Our absence must be felt. But your absence cannot be felt if you did not make your presence felt in the first place. Okay? So, what is the solution? Kingdom citizenship. We have to move from church to ecclesia. And when you understand that apostolic grace is not planting churches, apostolic grace is building civilizations. Different doctrine. Apostles build civilizations. We've zeroed it down to planting churches. Instead of actually changing the landscape completely. And colonization, establishing a kingdom economy. Then we'll get a global transformation. Then we will restore the things that God is asking. So I want to stop there and I want to share something different. Take your time to go read Noah. So I want to use Noah as a template. Okay? For you to understand how God works with people. And I want you to take that template and frame it on all those moves. Every single move will have applied this template. Okay? So God tells Noah to build him an ark. So I want to get contemporary now. We know the story, so as I won't even read it, but let's get contemporary. So I want you to practically think about this. God shows up and says, No, I want you to build an ark. Now, for us, because we read stories and what an ark is, we are all pretty impressed. Noah had no clue what God just said. An ark, what is an ark? Oh, an ark. It's a big boat. What is a boat? Remember the Bible says it had never rained in the earth. Because there will be a flood. What is a flood? And then, the flood will fill the earth. Okay, hold up. You want me to build something I've never heard of? To deal with a problem that has not occurred. That may occur with something we've never imagined. That's the assignment. Now I know how to build backwards. So think, if you showed up and found Noah building. First of all, it means Noah had to depend on God 100% for the design. Because he had no clue what an ark is. So if you read the book of Noah properly, it means God would give him design, he would build, then God would give him design. Yet he had no clue what he exactly was building. Wow. Because there was no reference point and there was no problem to deal with. Imagine that mindset. So if you showed up and found Noah to work, how would the conversation go? Hey Noah, what are you building? An ark. What's an ark? I don't know. But I'm building it. What is it for? To stop a flood. What is a flood? Lots of water. How much water? Lots. From where? Enough to fill the earth. Oh really? That's a smart idea right there. We've never had rain, never had a flood, no clue what that looks like. The water we know is what we drink, what we draw, probably from the Nile, the nearest river, or the Euphrates, whatever. And you're saying it's going to fill everything, and then you want to put everything in. So that's problem one. Problem two, I usually am fascinated. It's nice to say that the animals not put the animals in the ark. Now, Noah wasn't living in a zoo, was he? And all those animals in the ark come from various parts of the earth. And they operate at different speeds. So who arrived first? And for them to arrive, who told them? So is it possible that the animals Got an instruction from God before Noah did. Those are the stuff that, if you want to know the things that I think about when I'm alone, those are the kind of things that run through my head. And just show me how marvelous and how God operates. And if God gives you an instruction, all the other things are already in motion. 
Way beyond what you can see. We always think that we, this little instruction of cutting out is what's going to make everything work. No, everything else is in motion. I mean, the story of Noah is incredible. How did the animals cooperate without eating each other? We have no clue. So there's so many technical issues going on. How did he have supplies? Because for certain animals to live, they have to feed on others. So what was the model? So did God keep them all full for a year? We don't know. All we know is that this happened. It got together. It was completed. And we know that it took now 120 years to carry this out. And then God uses the ark for 367 days only. And then God shows up. And the first nice conversation he has with Noah is that I will never destroy the earth with a, with a flood again. Basically, the ark is useless. Completely useless. Your life's work. And in fact, just to confirm it, let me put a little rainbow in the sky. <laughs> For you to know I'm serious about this, I will never use the ark again. Then, he says, as long as the earth remains, seed time, harvest, summer, winter. So the Bible says, so Noah went and planted a vineyard. Noah changed his career without missing a heartbeat. From ark builder to vineyard planter. And you know, the way we read it, because that's what Sunday school taught us, we think Noah stepped out of the ark, planted a vineyard like in the cartoon, it grew, he drank, he got drunk, and stuff happened. That's how we read it. <laughs> Truth is, why start on the thing that takes the longest time to grow? Vines take forever, right? Mm. And then it takes wine even longer to be good wine that you can get drunk. So how many years are we talking? Between the arc exit and the day Noah got drunk. What's the picture? The picture is that God was beginning afresh and there would be time to accomplish things. So, the problem the church has, and most pastors and most ministers, is that we are ark builders. And when the flood is over, we refuse to exit the ark. We start the first church of the ark. There's no flood coming, but we keep people in the ark. Crisis is over. God says, exit. And God told Noah, leave the ark. God was so serious about the ark that we can't find it. Noah's life work. What's the picture there? That's exactly what happened with every move of God. Every move of God was exactly like that. God took years for us to build up and build these powerful moves that we've put together. But once that is accomplished, every move, Martin Luther's move was only as good as the gesture did by faith. Once that was established, the move was useless. It's the truth. The Pentecostal movement was just as good as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Once we got that done, but we want to stay in the monastery and keep doing this. That's how we become weird and become spooky. Because instead of getting the value, listen, your mobile phone is the best example of how a move of God should work. hundred years ago, this was 50 gadgets. Standalone calculator. Standalone. Think about how many things are in there. All of them were standalone products. They were invented, acts. They were great, acts. We got the value. It stayed. The framework, useless. Think about it. Your typewriter is sitting in here. Your video camera, for goodness sake, is sitting in here. How many things are sitting in here? Your documentation, your filing system. What used to be massive buildings is a little gadget. 
this is how the kingdom is supposed to be. Every single thing God gave us is supposed to be now part of us, not an organization. We are supposed to be dangerous and effective because I walk by faith. I'm filled in the Holy Ghost. I can have visions and dreams. I have all these moves are now personal realities. They are no longer systems. They are embedded. They are part of who we are now. What are we building next? We don't know. It's called an ark. Our problem is we want a design. We want a perfect formula. Don't you, you want me to tell you to buy what you want to three? All I can tell you is that it's being birthed here. We're doing the next step. It's called an ark. As we unfold one step, this week was a step. This meeting is a step. The pieces are coming together. When we are repeating to the step, God will give us the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And then suddenly, we'll be so successful, everybody will jump into the ark, and then God will say, get out. <laughs> we are off to a new level. That's what we mean by glory to glory to glory. That's the principle. So whenever we refuse to exit, God has absolutely no problem. He starts another move without us. He doesn't struggle. And we can be busy with our meetings. Busy with whatever we have. But he's already off doing something else. Let me tell you a story in the Bible. You all know Elisha and Elijah, right? What people do not know is that Elisha wasn't the first servant to follow Elijah. If you go back, you'll find that Elijah had another servant, unnamed. And Elijah said to his servant, the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. Stay here. Not use the term. The Lord has told me to go. But you, stay here. The Bible says, and the servant stayed. Elijah never went back for it. When he came to Elijah, he would say, the Lord has told me to go to battle. Elijah said, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I will go with you. So, in moves of God, we don't make demands for people to follow us. We go. And those who can hear God, follow. That's the accurate model. So where we are shifting to in the earth is the church structure is no longer effective in carrying out what God is doing. The church era arc is over. It was a great move. Powerful. It was by God, by the way. It's not by the devil. But God did not intend us to gather. God was not interested in an ark. God was interested in the cargo. Cargo was the issue. God needed to replenish the earth, not to domesticate the animals. <laughs> so the minute the flood was over, God gave Noah the exact command he gave Adam. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Why? Because the first generation missed it. And did you know that Noah is chapter 9. The Tower of Babel is chapter 11. Wow. Mm -hmm. Abraham is chapter 12. <laughs> Look at the shift. So God tells Noah, fill the earth. Genesis 11, under Nimrod, they say, let us not fill the earth. Lest we are scattered, let's build a tower. In direct disobedience, to God's instruction to fill the earth. Mm -hmm. Bible says they reached a plain and settled there. That's a problem with the church. When we reach a plain and things are easy, settle. They said, let's build for ourselves a city and a tower to heaven. In other words, let's build our own version of how to worship God. Mm -hmm. And God said, confuse their language. Yeah. Scatter them. In the scattering, God says to Abraham, get out of your father's house. That's the progression. <laughs> That's the order. So 
If there's a prophetic sound that God is releasing to the church today, it's called confuse their language. That's why churches can't agree. Conflict in the church. Oh, God is doing what he always does. Some will leave, some will settle. You realize Nimrod created Babylon, right? Created Nineveh, Karne, all those countries, cities. Even when Abraham left, those cities continued to exist. So the church, as it's con currently constituted, will continue to exist. But the church, as it is constituted, is a clear and present danger to the move of God. It has always been. All those people I mentioned, every single of those moves persecuted the next move. Wow. Every single one of them. The Lutheran persecuted the Baptists. Because the Baptists began to baptize in water, the Lutherans would hunt them down and find where they were being baptized and drown them. Christians. Because they thought that was heretical because they thought they were the custodians of the moon. The Baptists were the people who said the Holy Ghost cannot move in the earth. Hmm? The Pentecostals are the ones who said the Charismatics are prosperity preachers. They don't love God. The Charismatics said there are no prophets in the earth. God doesn't speak anymore. Apostles died. The apostles are saying kingdom wealth is materialism. Same old story, same old environment. So God has to scatter it again. So what's the difference? Somebody asked me, what's the difference between us and the past generations? We have one major advantage. We have the history to look at. So wow. we don't repeat the mistakes. Wow. That's the only thing we have. So we can look back and see and be careful not to fall into the same trap that God always has to. Now, I've only taught you two parallels. In the future, we'll talk about the other parallels. We'll talk about the parallels on the other side of the coin, about how then God causes shakings in the earth, which we interpret as wars, rumors of wars, pandemics, <laughs> which happen as part of the trigger point of the shaking. So if COVID happened in 2020, we're in the middle of the shaking. That's the only reason why, if you go into any church today, the people know something's not right, but the people choose to stay. That's the truth. The only people who are comfortable are people like me, the pastors. Because we are the ones running the show. So I couldn't teach this until God had me dismantle my own system. Completely. God said, look, you can have it and you'll be successful. You'll do very well. You'll excel. Listen, God has not destroyed the little ones, has he? They are all his children. But they are not the cutting edge of what he is doing. So one chooses whether to be part of a move, settle, or whether you're going to be in the cutting edge of what God is buffing next. And that's what changes everything around us. So stuff like this I don't share in churches. So when I preach in churches, I preach very really nice sermons. Because my job, I'm not God. My job is not to scatter anybody. My job is to be aware that there's something different happening. And to engage with that, and as we build things, and things crumble, people will have somewhere to go. Is the kingdom meaning we do not have leaders? Or we don't have uh, ministers? No, we are doing what God always ordained. The fivefold were for the entire body, not for a congregation. God never envisioned a picture where an apostle was only in a congregation. He was to believers anywhere. And each apostle brought specific grace to the body, irrelevant. And so 
That's a whole story for a different day. When we talk about then how is the dynamic of relationship, how do we still have impartation and leadership in the spirit? Because we're not also advocating anarchy. Mm -hmm. Not talking about rebellion and everybody hearing God for themselves. That's not what we are saying. But we are saying we are moving to a place where the word is greater than the speaker. So I can put what I speak online and never benefit from the people hearing it. But their lives are changed anyway. Now that takes us stop being visible and having impact instead. But the way we've structured it, we want to be superheroes. We want to be at the pinnacle. You know the problem with that? We become easy targets. That's why you're hearing so many scandals in the earth of pastors. You know why? They didn't delegate when they should have. Mm. And so the enemy knew, if I hit you, I will mess up X number of people. Of course you will be restored. Of course you will heal. But the amount of people in confusion before they find settlement, it's going to take a while, but the devil enjoys that. So, I said, listen guys, Jesus was smart. When they came to look for him in the garden, or, uh, um, in um, Gethsemane, they asked, which one is Jesus? Isn't that interesting? And Judas had to identify him. That's serious. I thought he was obvious everyone knew who Jesus was. Why did they need Judas? He says, the one that I kiss, that's Jesus. Many Jesus had developed such a structure that you couldn't tell who he was among the twelve. He had to be identified. Until we were able to do that, we were an easy target. Easy. When, 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 let me finalize with this. When David comes to Hebron, the Bible says the tribes came to make him king. But they all gathered from the different tribes. That's where we get that scripture, Second Chronicles. Because that's where you list the sons of Isaac. An interesting thing happens, as these people come, David makes a statement. He says, if you're for me, then God be with you. But if you're against me, then God will judge you. Why does David say that? He says that because all these guys coming have got so much capacity, so much strength, so much ability, that unless God sent them, they can overwhelm him. We need, you see, we built a church where everybody's weak, pastor is strong. Instead of the other way around, where everybody is strong, so pastor can be protected. So a strange thing happens. After they meet, they go out immediately to fight. And they fight against the sons of Anak, the giants. And David is almost killed. First time ever David is almost killed at war. And what the guy is telling them, captain says, listen, David, from now on, you stay in the palace. We go to war. Because if you die, then the light goes out of Israel. So it's safer now for you to be kept safe and for us to engage. Now that's the kingdom economy we have to build. An economy that if we are apostles, prophets, pastors, we hear God. We speak. You engage. We don't even have to be found. We don't need to be visible except to you. We won't be famous, but we'll be powerful. <laughs> so better power than fame. And that's how the apostles used to operate. Impacting people and releasing them. Impacting people and releasing them. So they could do things. That's why Paul would say to Timothy, when you appoint, who's doing the appointing? Timothy. Not Paul. To the church in the house of Aquila and Priscilla. To the, that, those guys are empowered. They are functional. So this is how we have to start thinking. We have to position people strategically. Some of you are going to sit in different places. I mean, you're sitting among some of the biggest interactions going on. We need a Daniel mentality in there, influencing it. We need a Joseph mentality, influencing it. You're no longer running a school. You're developing futures of people. Let me close with this story I think I gave you last night about 
how the Philippine nation began to change nations. This is a conversation that I had with a prophet who was very involved in it, Prophet Ocampo. He's one of the first guys ever walked into a room, and, and this was crazy. Had begun the kingdom business meetings, very small group, probably like 10, 15 people, and um, people had an idea what started to do that, and we'd call it the Cyrus community initially, before we even got into what we're doing. And so someone introduces this prophet to us. We're sitting in a meeting, a bigger meeting, and so I introduce him. As he stands up, he asks me, did God ask you to do something very weird, something to do with the Cyrus community? And everybody in the room basically goes, what? Because they know it's a conversation we're not having publicly with anybody. And so he says, why I'm asking you that is because God is going to ask you to do weird stuff. That doesn't sound like God, but it is God. But after this, ask me to tell you a story. Then you'll understand. So I'm telling you the story he gave me. So he said to me, you know, when they began as a prophetic group for nations in the Philippines. God told them that they have to affect nations and especially the Arab world. And so their first thinking was send preachers, send missionaries. And God said, if you say, no, just get killed, you'll be wasting our time. So we need strategy. So what was the most effective strategy they could use? And God told them, but you already have the strategy in your nation if you can open your eyes. So they began to pray and God showed them. Everybody knows. That Filipinos are the best maids in the world, right? There's a Filipino <coughs> maid even in the White House. In every prominent royal house on the earth, there's a Filipino maid. So, they treat Filipinos as missionaries. Yeah. Maids. <laughs> With one assignment, not to preach Jesus, but to raise the children in those households in the ways of God. Because most Arabs don't look after their children, they leave them to the maid. Especially the wealthy families, the father has no time for the children. It's a maid who raises the children. That is what we call the Arab Spring. That's what erupted. <laughs> That's the Arab Spring. Majority of those nations, if you track back the people who were involved, there were children who were brought up by these maids, who were breaking free of Islam. Today, Islam is crumbling. It doesn't require preaching. It's crumbling from within. That's why you see the changes you're experiencing. All these changes began 20, 15 years ago. They didn't start now. They started because God had people who were willing to be invisible, yet functional. <laughs> so, so imagine what you guys can do hidden in Dubai. And all of you here are hidden in plain sight. So you're the most effective possible to do because the next move of God is going to depend on economy, it's going to depend on trade, and kingdom believers have to work with trade to change nations. Today, if you walk into any African country, as a billionaire who wants to invest, you'll meet the president immediately. Mm. So is that much more powerful evangelism than a crusade? Because then you can shift policy. Then you can give conditions to the money you give. So God has changed his model. He's using wealth. And globally, all the wealth is zeroing into this nation. Everybody wants to keep their money here because it is safe. That's the truth. I'm sure you know the turnover of what's going on. All the gold reserves are now moving here. Why would God do that when you're all here? Because you're hidden like Moses in plain sight inside Pharaoh's house. So many believers, many of you are here. And the advantage many of you have is it was easier for you coming from the Asian continent, most of you, to come in. 
because nobody saw it coming that you would be Christians. It wasn't in the plan. It was Hindus, it was Asians, it was they are safe. What does God do? God goes and gets all of you born again in India and then sends you in. Strategy. Problem is, now many churches here who were sent here are busy doing missions out. Wrong focus. You know why? This is the reason. If you remain in prosperity, that's why this, when, I, when we do the Kingdom Economics Forum, I'll talk about church economy, Babylonian economy, and Kingdom economy, which hardly anybody has properly heard of Kingdom economy. But there's a the thing. Church economy is what? Some total in Dubai, some total of all the offerings that all the churches collect on Sunday. Can it build a building in Dubai? Right? What are you doing with it? You're sending it into Africa, You're sending it into India. You were sent here, you're not sent from here. It's a different ballgame. To build economy, to multiply it, to increase it, to invest it so that there's a real value that can now make changes. So you will still fund things, but you're supposed to fund it from a place of strength. Meaning, building schools, building universities, uh, funding businesses. What I'm doing with pastors in Liberia, we've got over, uh, we speak to over 500 pastors, I'm getting them all trained for skills, not for preaching, for business so that they can get engaged with their country and do business. Because they've done ministry forever and they're always depending on handouts. So it's better if they did business, then they own the facilities where they are, then they can rent out half as office, half as church and still have church. But they say the church centers now change into training centers. So now when I go, I do maybe one, two church services. The rest of the week is training. Training in sanitation, training in, in basic business, basic knowledge of how to trade and how to keep your books and how simple things. And you know what's funny? The economies of the church has begun increasing because people know how to do business now. In the past, people were coming for prayer. Now people are doing stuff. Now you can imagine that Dubai right now is probably one of the highest consumers of anything on earth. Because the numbers are increasing and you grow nothing. Go figure. So you import everything. So if you import everything, if you can control and access the source of where it comes from. Guys, I've been offered a thousand acres in Liberia for farming. I have no clue what to do there. I'm not a farmer. But imagine if we controlled from farm to table, <coughs> what that would look like. That's kingdom economy. And those are still believers. It'll be easier to have a conversation with them and forums with them and talk about the word with them when stuff is happening. So that's where many of you guys are shifting into. So I believe we've just started, we've just triggered the idea. You're all in place, you're all here. There are those who will choose to be in church. And you can't, don't fight them, don't force them, don't push them. We are all configured differently. But there's a group that God is going to pull out. And that's all he needs. That's going to set up systems that are going to revolutionize the world. The only thing we don't have, that the Muslim and the Jew has, is systems. Although, well, get our systems right. And yet, we all work in all their systems. We make it work. So we're not fools. We just don't have boldness. And the one thing, when I come back, we'll deal with it. We'll deal with the Indian cultural spirit. Can I explain how that works? No risk. <laughs> don't take a risk. Do something that you know is sure, specific, and we'll work out. Don't try new things. 
because you are you are taught to be efficient. Innovation is a struggle. That's why I hardly hear people talk about I need to start a business. So I mean, you guys are different, but everybody else wants a job, right? It's okay. So when we come for that forum, we'll talk about Daniels, Josephs, and Jacobs. Daniels are usually in government. Josephs are in entrepreneurship, but working with the government. Jacobs, businessmen, innovators. And there's a whole dynamic on, as we talk about Joseph, talking about all the how to find your purpose, we take it to the next level. Are you a Daniel, a Joseph, or a Jacob? Because that's going to determine the functionality. You know what is funny about all of them? They all could interpret dreams. Mm. <laughs> that's a unique thing. Yet they function in totally different fields. Wow. So those are some of the things that we will be dealing with when we deal with kingdom economy. Kingdom economy is a whole new ballgame. It gives you authority, it gives you success, access, it gives you functionality. Totally different ballgame. Then you understand the difference between church economy and kingdom economy. So guys, we now can talk until tomorrow morning, so stop there. I just have to stop. Any questions? Wow. Yeah, I, I think I'll go first. So Pastor Charles, we had a lovely conversation that most people in the room didn't get to hear. Mm -hmm. I think I think some of the guys in this room need to hear it. Ian, I know for a fact because I know some of Ian's history. I know Ian has had a lot of lot of uh, content about you know the end of the age and things mm -hmm. are coming to an end and mm -hmm. a whole Matthew twenty four, which we thank him for the first ten years of my Christian life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I heard more about the rapture in my first year of faith than I did about any other subject. And so, Matthew 24, after John 3.16, I think the next talk to me was Matthew 24. And that, that's, yes. and we joked about yes. the movies, the Left Behind movies, yes. and, uh, and there were so many other yeah. other movies and so on mm. that, 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 that actually shaped that. Yeah, yes. and so many in that season. Yes. But uh, you really broke down something in our conversation that I think guys in the room need to hear, which is about uh, 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 even that whole undis misunderstanding of the word rapture. The word doesn't even appear in scripture. Yes, yes. And the misunderstanding of even how, yes. you know, what it really means. Okay. Let me just throw it in in a nutshell. Well, why it amuses me is because I always tell people that half of this stuff I taught them. I taught this stuff with all my heart. And I was one of, and a man I can communicate. I got people saved out of fear. It worked. By fear, you mean the hellfire? Place. Of course. I mean, all the, and I can be very graphic about the creatures that will bite you and stuff like that. <laughs> but all of those are just nice stories. Now, this is the thing. Because of the depth that I pushed and said, God, something, I know what I'm saying. Something deep in my heart, if I'm honest, this and your nature and your character, there's a miss. It's, it's like you're a schizophrenic God. Like on the one hand, you've got this major plan to wipe out a whole group of people. And on this other hand, you're this amazing, loving God. And we keep selling the story of a God who, who is also just, as if just means mean. So your nature doesn't connect. So if, if truly your nature is superior and your nature pre-existed everything, then I'm going to use your nature as a template to start looking through scripture. So the first thing I saw in scripture was that it's not God's will that any man should perish. Mm. Mm. Any. It's got nothing to do with Christians. Okay? So that's the truth. Then it says, hell was created for the devil and his angels. So the original creation of hell had nothing to do with mankind. God has no intention of anybody going to hell. People will go to hell, but that was not God's intention, which means in God's economy, going to hell is because you've crossed all the lines, you've refused. Not because you've made mistakes. Two different things. So then I began to study, look at, to look at the rapture story. And thank God I love history because history helped me put things into so, I mean, right now I can't go into the whole story, but let me give you a few of the things that we all know, that we've been taught, and then let's query them properly. 
We are talking about Matthew 24, 25, where Jesus basically, supposedly, is talking about the end. Yet the disciples asked, what shall be the sense of the end of the age? In the word their age is eon, or era. It's not the word world. But we've decided it's the end of the world. Then he says, the sign of the end of this age that I'm talking about, eon, is there shall be wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, pestilences. Nice so far. But this is the problem. The next thing he says is not what we say. He said, you go read it. He says, this is not the end. Statement number one. This is the birth pangs. Mm. Meaning, this is the beginning of something, not of the end of something. What have we thought? So whenever we see war, what do we think is happening? End of the world. The end of the world. You see pestilence, you see what you think is the end of the world. So we've entered this cyclic thing that every time there's a crisis in the earth, we think it's the end. So we prepare for the end. And it doesn't happen. And then we are back in the earth. And by the time we are back, the world went. We play catch up. But let's use the one that has been taught. <coughs> Where the movies came from. Distant thunder, mark of the beast, you know them all. The disciples asked him this question. They said, Master, what shall be a sign of the end? Okay? So he gives those things I've said, but he adds this. He says, it shall be like in the days of Noah. You've heard that statement. They shall be eating, drinking, taking in marriage until the flood came and destroyed them. So shall it also be like in the days of Lot. They were eating and drinking, taking in marriage until the fire came and destroyed them all. <coughs> Sorry, so far so good? He mm. says, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes. They shall be eating, drinking, taking in marriage. Two shall be walking, one shall be taken. Two shall be in bed, one shall be taken. Remember the stories? Yeah. So up to now, the way you've all immediately interpreted that is how we've interpreted it for years. And even now I said it deliberately so that you still interpret it exactly the way you always do. So as far as we are concerned, who shall be taken away? Us, right? We'll go to be with him. Okay, so let's walk back what I just said to show you just how dangerous wrong doctrine is. It shall be like in the days of Noah. They were eating, they were drinking, they were giving in marriage, right? Until the flood came and destroyed them all. Who is them? <coughs> Noah or the unbelievers? Who was destroyed by the flood? Unbelievers. So who was taken away? Very good. So shall it be like in the days of Lot. They were eating, Drinking, taking in money until the fire destroyed them all who was destroyed. So shall it be when the Son of Man comes. Two shall be walking, one shall be taken. Which one? <laughs> who shall be taken? The unbelievers. But what have we always said? So who shall remain? So God's plan has always been for us to remain. Restore. Noah remained. Lot remained. So when the Son of Man comes, but what have we taught? We will go. And because the Jehovah's Witness have got it warped and weird, we fight that reality because we understand it. So then we say, oh, but Thessalonians, Paul says, when he, when he comes, we shall, be, he shall, we shall meet him in the air, right? And we shall be like him, lovely. Here's the problem. Problem number one, the term used there in the Bible, rapios, which we like to, to, to translate and call rapture. The word rapture doesn't exist in the Bible, by the way. It's an invention of Christians. It's not in the Bible. It sounds very nice. Rapios is the Greek term to be 
rapturous, to be excited, to be glad, to be receiving someone you haven't seen in a long time. It doesn't mean you're going anywhere. Oh, that's <laughs> 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 Now, listen to the next thing. He says, when he returns. Okay, wait. This same Jesus, why do you look up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up in the same way will? Hmm, I didn't hear them say you will go. Okay, let's try something else. <laughs> Paul says, so let's use Paul. And we just seen what Peter said, whom the heavens must withhold. By now you notice it's Jesus who's coming, it's not us who are going. I hope it's becoming clear. Okay. So, to explain the illustration to Tara, I told him, let's, let's, for the sake of this example, let me be Jesus, okay? Last time I was in Dubai, I was here and we talked. And I said, I am going and I will return, okay? So the day I returned, he came to meet me in the airport. Was he coming to my country or was I coming to Dubai? So, when he returns, we will meet him. Who says we're going? See how we quickly prefer to create, there is no proof in scripture that we're exiting. There's no verse for it. It's something we interpret because we were taught that the world is getting toxic the world is getting worse, it's getting darker, so we have to go. No, the world is getting darker because you are the light. And God expects you to fix it, not to escape it. If I die today, where do I go? To heaven. But here's the problem. Revelation 23, 24 says, And I saw the bride coming out of heaven. And I heard a voice say, Behold, the dwelling of God is among men. It doesn't say, Behold, the dwelling of men is with God. God created the earth with the intention. He's never changed his mind. Oh yes, I know, I taught it, I said, but this earth will pass away, right? It also says heaven will pass away, so where will you be? <laughs> Go read it. It says heaven and earth will pass away. So even if you're going to heaven, heaven is also going to? That means that can't be what we think it is. Mm. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Why take us to heaven and then destroy the earth and destroy heaven? The term pass away that's used there in the Greek is heaven and earth in this current construct will change and go back to its original order. That's in the Greek. Maybe. That's in the Greek. Basically, the Greek understood it. That's why nobody in the New Testament taught the end. Peter didn't teach it. Nobody taught it. All the writers taught about you, how to function, how to love your brother, how to operate. Nobody taught about how to live because they didn't have that thinking. Do you know what they thought? They all thought Jesus would return in their time. Every single one of them, they lived like Christ is coming. And when now, he comes, he yes, find us. Yes, he'll story. find us functional. Every parable Jesus came about a gave about a master going ends with a master returning. Have you noticed? Every single parable. And when the master returned to check on the vineyard, when the master returned to check on the workers, when the master returned to check on the talents. And the guy who had produced more talents, what was his reward? Give him more. Get him back to work. Not thank you, let's go rest. <laughs> <laughs> so until we have that mindset, will Jesus return? Yes. But you know what? And this is the best way to explain this model. It took me a long time to understand this. I was, I was sharing this with Manisha yesterday. I said, you know, I like asking God weird questions because he'll give you answers. And sometimes the answers are so profound that they open up your sight to see things. I ask God this question that every believer and every preacher thinks, but nobody wants to ask God. 
You thought it too. When Adam messed up, why didn't you fix it with him? Why involve us? I mean, God, you're God. Adam has sinned. Fix him. Start afresh. Why allow things to get this bad? I asked God. God gave me the answer, and it's profound. God said, I couldn't do anything because I couldn't. Now that sounds odd. You are God. You have all power. You have all capacity. How is it possible that you could not, which literally means he was unable to. How can God be in that state? It says, go back and read what I did, then you will understand. It says, and God said, let them have done with you. Yeah. Let them have authority. He said, I gave them all power in the earth. Yes. I had none. Because I am God. Can't yeah. interfere. The only way I could interfere was to come as a man. Yes. Because only a man has power yeah. in the earth. That's where redemption started. Yeah. And that's why for years the devil tried to stop it. He knew what would happen. Because God had to come as a man to have authority. Yes. And what did Jesus do? He came as a man, gave us back the authority, then left. Now we want to follow him. <laughs> Instead of using the authority he has given us. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, and so said I you. So we should take charge. Because heaven is waiting on us. God is convinced. He's sure we are going to change the world. He is sure the kingdom will come. The will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And all the enemies shall be laid down. But the guys who are supposed to be dealing with it are all busy running. <laughs> so that's how we have to change. So I've given you the bigger picture. But the steps start. Now for whatever reason, listen, when God chooses something, we don't query it. We just comply. I cannot explain why it's Dubai. I don't know why it's Dubai. And I'm not the only one. I've spoken to a number of prophets. I spoke to Curtis. I asked him, why did you come to Dubai? He said, God told him. God told him. That's why you do it. I've spoken to prophets in different places. And they all say this in Dubai. Now, when I got here, I didn't talk much about it. It's only, I think, yesterday that I posted one of your pictures on Facebook and on some of our platforms. And you know what people are saying? It has started. It has started. I know prophets were saying, yeah, he says, so you found the men of peace. You found the place where God is going to do this. Prophets know. They just know. That's what God is going to do here. That's what was today on Sean Ball's website as well today. He just said the same thing. Guys, I just want to share this with you. God is so kind. Holy Spirit is so kind. He will, he will work. He, he will make sure you don't miss what he has for you. Everything that Pastor Charles shared, do you know where I first heard it? Take a wild guess, guys. Even before I got married, 2008, 2009, when I was without a job, I had all the time in the world, those nine months I was sitting with Ian. Some of you know Ian Richardson was not in the room. And that's when somebody had given me a DVD series called Driven by Eternity, a four-part DVD series. Four-part DVD series called Driven by Eternity. You know who authored that? Who was the speaker on that? John Bevere. Every single thing that you heard tonight But you know who else preaches on this? Miles Monroe. Oh. You know exactly. But my point is when I first heard it was 2008-2009 and I'll be honest with you, it messed with my head because I was in Kings mm -hmm. and for four years I was hearing about rapture and then I heard Driven by Eternity. Completely yeah, yeah, yeah. messed my head out. It completely messed my head out and I was like, mm -hmm. Okay, and if you notice, I, that's not the DVD I shared with anybody because it, it, it messed my head up. But that's John Bevere. Mm -hmm. That's John Bevere. Four DVDs on every single word that he spoke. And John Bevere says, I know most of you are looking like, at me like I'm crazy, but the, the reason you're looking at me like that is because you're not reading your Bible. 
It's amazing what's in there if you would only read it. Yeah. It ends up just coming on Sunday and listening to you know, he, you know John Bevere. Yeah, yeah, and he he's really cuts it. Yeah. Now, now obviously with time down it has become a bit more yeah. you know softer. softer. But that was the cream of John Bevere is like the late two thousands times when he was like really, yeah. really getting it, you know. But my point is that everything you've heard today, it's not new. And I feel like I had to wait all this time. It's like almost like a, yeah, a knock in the head. See, buddy, I told you this back in 2008, but you were not willing to listen because your, your head was in another space. It's hard to understand things. You know? exactly. But a number of things. Remember the story I gave about the animals mm. and Noah? God was waiting 120 years. Listen, I don't think it took Noah 120 years literally to win the ark. That's the amount of time it took everything to fall in place. Mm -hmm. The animals to move, everything, whatever you want to look at. And I believe, even here in Dubai, there's a lot of people God is going to switch on. I'll give you the vision that I saw about Dubai when I was praying about it before I came in. Uh, like I said, God has a sense of humor, God loves fun, God will talk to you according to where you operate from. So people think God is always, in fact, the Jesus people have. And Remember, I'll talk to you about Abraham in just now in a moment, okay? God showed me the picture. If you've watched, I, I don't know which of the, the Transformer movies, where a beam comes from the sky yes. and then it hits, and then this creature that's been here all along rises. It's the rise of something. Yes. Rise of something. Exactly. That's exactly what God's going to Yeah. Something like that. So... No. Yeah. Megatron. Yeah. Yes. Suddenly, Megatron was here all along. And he's away. Looking like junk. Yeah. So, the Megatron of the kingdom in Dubai has just been hit by that signal. It's about to start arising. And everything is going to shift completely. Let me, let me just finish with giving you a picture of Abraham. God totally messed up my mind and began to show me people in scripture away from a religious mindset. So let me give you a story. We all know that Abraham has left, he's going towards Egypt. And so the picture we all have in church is Abraham is this elderly old man with some animals, right? Who's going and traveling along with his, his wife and passing through Egypt. First, we must understand at that time, Egypt was a superpower. So it was Babylon. So understand this conversation in context. When Abraham says to his wife, when the king sees you, say, you're my sister. Yes. He is informing you that he's got government protocol. That when he arrives in a nation, he meets the king. That's not the Abraham you know. Because where will the king see you? So my wife always says that I usually use this with her as my prop. So she says, with permission, copyright. I usually say, it would be like me saying to my wife, we're traveling to Dubai. When the Emir sees you, tell him you're my sister. What are the chances of the Emir seeing that? In real life? Hardly. Unless I was somebody who, when you march through a nation, it is a requirement for you to interact with the leader of the nation. So Abraham's protocol level was governmental. So that's one picture of Abraham we don't understand. The second picture we don't understand is that an interesting story is told. Four kings capture five kings in war. Genesis 12. These four kings, so that's, think about it, four kings, so they have armies. Go and fight and capture five kings and their armies. In that movement, they pass through Sodom and capture Lot and go with him. So get the picture right. And Abraham gets to hear that his cousin has been taken by an army. And Abraham takes off to go get his cousin. It's not about how big the army is. It's about someone's got my cousin. So what kind of people did Abraham have with him that he was convinced he could take on an army that large and rescue his cousin. his cousin. See, we read the Bible wrong. So our father of faith 
was a military leader with mercenaries. He was a prince from where he came from. He wasn't a shepherd looking after some animals somewhere. He went, rescued these guys, come back, and he's only interacting with kings. The king of Sodom wants to meet him, but before he meets him, the king of Salem meets him. He interacts with kings. So we have to totally destroy our religious mindset of how these guys function. Today, if you made a movie of that, it would be better than Game of Thrones. Literally, because that's the level they function at. Think of Daniel in Babylon. What was the level of function? You know, one day I made a joke in, in a seminar with pastors. I said, I have seen first and second kings, but I've not seen first and second pastors in the Bible. So God deals with kings. That's his model. We want to now enclose him in churches. That's not how he functions. If we're going to function, we are going to touch kings. In this nation, we have to start strategizing people who will become advisors to the emir, mm. who hear from God and give advice. That's how, when God wanted to save the nation of Israel, he didn't use prophets. He used Esther, a queen. But she had a mentor, see, who was invisible. It's always like that. So we have to change our mindset of how we operate. That's how it has to happen. One more, thing, one more thing I just wanted to add, guys. So, believe it or not, believe it or not, the cessationists and evangelicals have got more than one problem. One of their problems is that obviously they don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. But believe it or not, and it's, you can go check it online as well, I was surprised that their, their criticism of Bethel was not just prosperity gospel or no. their criticism of Bethel was not that oh they believe the gifts of the spirit, the gifts of the spirit not for today. Their primary or in that list of, of their criticisms against Bethel is they're like they preach Bethel preaches dominion theology. Yes. And I was like, what? Yep. That's a criticism. <laughs> and then and then I understood that the, the kind of demonic thinking that's crept in, that not only are you against the gifts of the Spirit, not only are you against you know, women teaching, preaching, and all of that, not only are you against you know, yes. all the other stuff, you're actually against this whole idea that believers are so, we as Christians are supposed to have. To change. Jesus is a dominionist. Which is exactly <laughs> what we were meant to. Jesus talked about the kingdom every single day. He was, he is a dominionist. That's the truth. There's no other message. Any and, other message, we created. And so here's the crazy thing. The reason why the gospel of the kingdom is so critical is because if you don't have an understanding of that, you replace that gospel of the kingdom with... And that's easy. You'll just gather in church and have a nice Sunday, then go the rest of the Monday, be bashed by the devil, and then Sunday come for healing, and then Monday you're gone. So it's cyclic. Like, that's it. But if you shift on Monday, you step out, things shift. Things shift. What if they stop us from having meetings at all? Will we stop functioning? We have to have a new model that cannot be, be locked into limited to meetings. That's the problem. We have to change our model because we can meet anyhow. We can meet online. We can have conversations like this and change the world. You know, people talk about the underground church in China. Listen, that's the most vibrant church in the earth. I know places where the way they have meetings, no poster, no email, nothing. The Holy Ghost has to tell you. So if you don't show up, you know you don't hear God. <laughs> that's another, it's doable. We can switch that on. So instead of prophesying every day, we need to have a prophetic activation so guys are prophetic at their office. They don't prophesy, they just guide stuff. We have to change how the kingdom works completely. True that. Any questions? Yes. Any, any questions? Yes. Come on, now is your time. Now is your time. Mr. Randall, any questions, any thoughts? Any feedback as well? Any thoughts, any feedback?
What's your feedback? Or what is your opinion on covering of head for women? That is my covering. Of the, I just covering of head for women. You covering of head for okay. women. Okay. In Pentecostal still it is. It's I, a, I, that's a question from someone who's just come back from India. <laughs> <laughs> I am so happy. I am so happy you raised it because I'm literally going to open the scripture. I won't even. I won't even give you a revelation. We'll read it slowly and prove to you that the church is mad and how it reads the Bible. <laughs> it's completely mad. They read what they want. Covering the man, the husband. No, no. Some, some, some preaching is in there. Yes. Covering the husband or something. Okay, we'll get into it. You guys want to go there? Do you have the time? Let me just deal with this simple one. So Manu is just trying to get into it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm I got someone. it. So. Let's just open a simple scripture. Because they exactly read it. Yes, they read it and they still misinterpret it. That's how crazy the church is. You're reading it in plain words and you're still interpreting it the way you want and it's there. So we're just going to read it because if I explain it, it won't be as funny as if I read it. Okay? So we're going to actually open the actual scripture. Yeah. You know the scripture, right? It turns out that after Romans, Corinthians is the most controversial letter. <laughs> so, so strange, right? So strange whether it's about the gifts and all Because people don't understand how weird the Corinthians were. <laughs> they, they, they used to say that, apart from Ephesus, they used to say had more gods than men. <laughs> Sounds interesting, right? <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's just pop it. Yeah. And actually read it. Because it's funny. And the best way, I wish my wife was here. This is one of her favorite. She's got to come back. By the way, guys, next next one, we were just talking in the car. I was having a, a personal conversation with, uh, with Pastor Charles and just talking to him about state of marriages, uh, you know, uh, and, and all of that. And. First Corinthians 11 16. Alright. Read. Kingdom, kingdom marriage is the next thing. I, 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 I want you to because read because this scripture is one of the funniest yeah. scriptures in the Bible. Uh, yeah, it's not quite covering the marriage in worship. Stop. Don't start there. I want you to start early because this is where the trouble starts. The trouble starts because people jump to that scripture, that part, without reading the whole context. Okay. So we're going, to, we're going to look at the context and then you'll see why it's funny. Okay. I praise you because you remember me and everything and uh-huh. retain the traditions as I pass them on to you. Mm-hmm. I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man. Okay, hold. And a man is hold the right there. Yeah. I'm going to use props. Come. If we're going to do this, then you're going to see. Okay? So I want you to come. Come. I need, I need four people. So we're going to just do something interesting here. I need one more person. Oh, Mr. Randall, you asked the question. <laughs> no, I want you because you asked. I want you to follow the story. Okay. But this is going to help everybody. It's going on late. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Okay? Just stand in line. Yeah, We're going to do this. Start with the first one. I'd like you to know that. Uh, I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man. So, I'm going to make him Christ. And he's going to be the head of man. Okay? Continue reading. And the man is the head of a woman. So the man is the head of a woman. And, and okay. Yes. Continue. Go on. Um, and, uh, and God is the head of Christ. And God is the head of Christ. So we have an order. Man, Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. And God is the head of Christ. Okay? Continue. Any man mm-hmm. prays or prophesies with mm-hmm. his head covered, his grace is his head. Stop. Any man who prophesies with his head, who is his head? Christ. Christ. Covered. His grace is his head. That means any prophetic word that doesn't have the character of Christ is a false prophet. Not the hat, 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 hat. <laughs> he, began, he began by giving you the formula, the head of every man. So we shouldn't change the structure. 
He said, but I would have you understand. He's talking about headship, not heads. Okay? So, man, so but what do we do when we pray? When we pray, we remove heads. Let's be logical for a moment. How would the heart affect prophecy? Just think about it. How would the heart affect prayer? We're mad. He's talking about you cannot have a prophetic word that does not carry the character of your head. That's why he began by first explaining who is whose head. head. Now let's continue now. Now, any man praying or prophesying with his head covered, meaning, meaning he, he cannot cover Christ. He cannot replace him. But any woman who prays and prophesies with her head, uh -huh. uncovered. Uncovered. Who is her head? Who is her head? So any woman who prays and prophesies with her head, uncovered. Who exposes him? Who embarrasses him? Who shames him? She cannot now stand up and say she can pray and prophesy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see? Continue. Um, For it is the one and the same thing as having a shaved head. So, he's talking to Corinthians. For a woman to shame her husband, embarrass him, and claim to be a prophet is not different from being shaved. Why? Because in Corinth, the temple prostitutes were shaved. Mm -hmm. So he's giving so them I, the example of it would you'd be no different yeah. from that if that's how you behave. And Corinthians were known for sexual immorality. Exactly. Corinthians were known for sexual immorality. There you go. For if so. a woman will not cover her head, she she should cut off her hair. So if a woman, listen to how deadly that segment is. If she will not cover her head, in other words, don't shame him, cover him. Cover him has to do not with covering your head, but respect, honor. If you don't do that, you are no different. You might as well cut your hair and be like the temple prostitute. But there you go. It is graceful for a woman to have her hair cut off uh -huh. or her head shaved, yes. she should cover her head. Thank you. Meaning. If it is shameful for her to behave like the temple prostitute, then it is, it is proper for her to have honor for her husband. Mm. Right? Continue. For a man should not have his head covered, uh -huh. since he is the image and glory of God. Thank you. You cannot have your head covered, because your head is the image and glory of God. Not your head. There's no way your head is the image and glory of God. Christ is the image and glory of God. All right? But the woman is the glory of man. The woman is the glory of man. Now let's continue reading. For so man did not come from woman, uh -huh. but woman from man. Okay. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but mm -hmm. woman for man. Okay. For this reason, a woman should have a symbol of authority on her head mm -hmm. because of the angels. Aha. Uh -huh. A symbol of authority, meaning as long as she's in honor. Now, why would he use the term angel? It's because when Eve fell, who tempted her? A fallen angel. Yeah, yeah. But if she had been in oneness with her husband, oh, it would not have happened. Oh my God. My God. This is a very, whenever you see nonsense in the church, be sure a very powerful revelation has been stolen. Mm. Continue. In the Lord, woman is not independent of man, uh -huh. but is man independent of woman. Yes. For just as woman came from man, uh -huh. so man came through woman. Yes. But all things came from God. Meaning, just this combination, yourself. none in God's eyes, this has to work together. Mm -hmm. Each came from the other, each is dependent on the other. He's not talking superiority, he's talking oneness. Oh my gosh. My gosh. Continue. Judge for yourself. Mm -hmm. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Is it proper for her to be shameful, backbiting, speaking about her husband and then coming to pray? Mm -hmm. Is it proper? Then it says, does not nature itself teach you that if a man has a long hair, mm -hmm. it is a disgrace for him. Uh -huh. But if a woman has a long hair, uh -huh. it is her glory. So wait. Like a question. So if her having hair is her glory, 
Why is she covering it? That's what it says. To prove to you that he's not talking about her. He just said, if it is shameful for her to cut her hair, because her hair is her. So there's no way you can be instructing you to cover your head yeah. if your hair is your glory. For her hair is given to her for a covering. Thank you. If anyone intends to quarrel about this, yes. we have no other practice nor do the churches of God. In other words, he's making it clear. Do not say I'm talking about her. Her hair is her glory. Yeah. And if her hair is her glory, even nature says she should have her hair. So who told us to tell her to cover her hair? He never said that. So Paul never left anything unturned. Just in case you step in that way, he says, listen, I know what you guys are thinking. We don't have a law that says you should cover her head. What about Joseph's hair? Joseph, now, I can explain that one. Why did Joseph ha shave his beard? Did you know that the Jews didn't shave yeah. at all? Is it legal? Just against the law. But God was telling him, if you're going to work under Pharaoh, you're going to shave your beard. And so he was doing the most difficult thing that you could do. To be able to function around Pharaoh, otherwise Pharaoh would not have received this wisdom. Tells you, God is always breaking the rituals, man. <laughs> Come on, thanks to our people. Yeah. So we think that God is obsessed with externals. <laughs> he isn't. He's, he doesn't care. He doesn't care. Randy, grow your hair, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> So, Sounds every like single time, prayer, you remove your head. Listen, the guy who's moving his head is not even praying. Were there hats when, when Paul was right on my story? No. So what covering did men have when Paul was working? Do you realize it's an absurd thing? Today we have caps, which were invented a hundred years ago. Now we're removing it. But when Paul was there, everybody had a hoodie, by the way. Yeah. Including the men. Yeah. They never removed it. But that's, I'm just showing you how many doctrines in the church are hiding powerful revelations. What I just explained to you is also applicable to marriage on how the order works. works. Yeah. So a woman will say, a man will say, my wife is not submitting to me. I'll say, are you submitting to Christ? Because yeah. if you're submitting to Christ, the order is immediate. Yeah. Very simple. That's how this, the, I think I could teach you a hundred things with just this form in that scripture. So, next time I can ask all those questions. There are many. I went through them and God broke them into pieces. <laughs> I used to be good at that stuff. Thank you. Thank that's you. really where it comes from. Now you learn one thing. When you read your scripture, <laughs> think about it. <laughs> Ask questions. Yes. Like, God, what's happening here? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I've said a simple thing. I usually give everybody who ask how do you read. I usually say simple. Read the pretext and the post text to get the context. Yeah. Mm. That's the simplest thing. Then ask yourself in every scripture, who am I in this story? So, either I'm the blind guy, or I'm the prodigal son, it doesn't matter. Once you get that right, that scripture will open up more clearly. Yeah. So. Wow, awesome. Thank you, Pastor Charles. Wow. Awesome.